Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things shall be accomplished which were written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man. Words taken from the gospel for this Quinquagesima Sunday in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I once saw a holy card that showed our blessed Lord at the gates of heaven, glowing with light from within, but also in the glory of heaven around him. He had his arms out. And the caption in the holy card said, I did not say it would be easy, but worth it. Did not say it would be easy, but worth it. Lent is upon us. It is not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be a grand time. But if we embrace it properly, it will be worth it. In today's gospel, we heard that his majesty is on his way up to Jerusalem from the lowest ditch in the world, the lowest ditch in the world that's not underwater, and that's the Jordan Valley. Our Lord was walking through Jericho, the lowest of all cities in the world, located some 900 feet below the level of the sea. Note well that his majesty was walking through, through Jericho. For there is no place for a believer to stay long in that city. It is cursed, it was destroyed, and anyone who rebuilt it would be cursed, and they rebuilt it. This place has long been held by the fathers of the church to symbolize the city of the world, the flesh, and the devil. It is the haunt of Satan, at least in symbol. It is Egypt, with all its technologies, pleasures, sounds, and smells, foods, and passions. It's flesh pots. We can imagine it as pumping out all kinds of smoggy smoke and sounds. It is a city on the edge of an abyss, polluted. That place we call hell is right by it. It's the closest you can get to hell on the surface of the earth. Remember, hell is in the earth. Always been hell to be underground, below the sea level. Fatima children saw the ground open up and Our Lady showed us hell where poor sinners go. Those unwilling to leave the city and they end up dying in it, slide into that abyss. This is where fallen man starts out. We all started out in Jericho. This is symbolized by the poor blind beggar. How did we end up here? Why must I start at Jericho? Because Adam left Jerusalem, the city of God, and went down to Jericho. This is indicated in the parable of the Good Samaritan. On leaving Jerusalem, Adam was waylaid by robbers, that is, by the devil. And he was thrown into a ditch. And that ditch just happens to be the deepest valley in the world. Once again, the closest to hell we can get. But the good Samaritan, that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, King of Kings, came down from heaven and provided the remedy. A way back up the mountain, a way back to the heavenly city of God, the new Jerusalem. If only we're willing to respond to our Lord's grace, to believe, to see as did the blind man in the gospel and follow him up the mountain and stop sinning. Nearby the city of Jericho is the Jordan River. Through its waters made fit for baptism by our Lord's baptism, we leave Jericho behind and enter the path of the mountain, up the mountain to Jerusalem. We leave Jericho behind and we enter that mountain path. We are redeemed in the waters. We're bought back, as it were, from the devil by Christ. And that is not enough, though, if you know anything about human nature. We're like the Israelites at that point at the edge of the Red Sea. Although they were washed clean of all sin, symbolized by the dead Egyptians washed upon the shore, these same Israelites nevertheless had a long desert to pass through with many trials to overcome. And many didn't make it. The ground opened up one time and swallowed a whole group of them alive. 
So in a similar way, even after baptism, each of us must work out our salvation. By what? Climbing the mountain. Lent is here, folks, to help us renew these climbing efforts. Is this not captured in today's gospel? The blind man has left the worldly city. He's living outside the city. He knows that living in the city has been an empty experience. He's ready to let it go. But he's still blind. He can't see. He knows not where to go. He cannot see the top of the mountain. He cannot see. He has no faith. He can only sit there outside of the city and beg. Thus our Lord moves him to beg for mercy. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, he cried out. Notice also how the difficulties involved with converting are expressed in this gospel. And they that went before him rebuked him that he should hold his peace. There's always some opposition to conversion and further conversion. We must be tested. Going up is not easy. Anyone can go down. The world rejoices when you mitigate, when you give in and go down. There's a great lesson in this that holds for all conversions away from worldliness, regardless if they be before or after baptism. When conversion takes hold, we will be tested. And we'll be tested often, even dissuaded by those nearest us, our fellow travelers, supposedly, even our own family. It was the believers, those in the company of our Lord, who kept rebuking and trying to silence the blind man. Yet by his perseverance and begging for help, the blind man was granted the gift of faith. Now he can see. Now he can follow the Lord up. So if you want to convert, you want to do a little penance, get ready for opposition. Get ready for resistance during this Lent. The gospel makes it clear that Jerusalem is up and his majesty is climbing a mountain because the holy city is some 3,500 feet up the mountain. Here we see a repeated theme of the sacred scriptures. In other words, our God is a mountain God. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, speaking to Abraham, our father in faith, he called himself El Shaddai, God of the mountain. Where did Abraham meet with God? On a mountain, almost every single time. Mount Moriah, he was told to sacrifice his only son. Later on, Moses met and spoke with God on mountains, Mount Sinai, and he died on Mount Nebo. St. Elias, the great prophet, fought the false prophets on Mount Carmel and spoke with God on Mount Horeb. The temple was built on Mount Moriah. The Last Supper was set on Mount Zion, right next door. Our Lord discussed his exodus from the world on Mount Tabor. He wept and sweat blood on Mount Olivet. He preached a sermon on the mount. Also, we could add that St. John of the Cross wrote the Ascent of Mount Carmel. It's a common theme that runs down Catholic spirituality. In the vision part of the third secret of Fatima, which is the only part we ever received, a mountain is shown. This mountain theme teaches us one of the first requirements for eternal life is knowing up from down. It's that simple, folks. I want to go up. Then you got to do what's required. You got to put on the gear required to climb a mountain. These two basic orientations up and down, immediately evident to our senses, regulate everything that exists. Our Lord speaks of the Son of Man descending from heaven and ascending back. In the Mass, the Lord descends upon the altar through the consecration and remains in our presence. And then we send Him back, as it were, to heaven with all our prayers and petitions. Thus, one of the reasons why the Holy Sacrifice is called the Misa. After the last words of the Mass, Ite Misa Est. It is sent, where? Back to heaven. We send Christ with all our prayers to heaven. Up. 
Heaven is up, hell is down. The gospel also tells us what is waiting for his majesty at the top of the mountain. As he spoke so clearly, no one understood. His passion, his death and resurrection awaited him. His exodus out of this world that he discussed with Moses and St. Elias on Mount Tabor. This is the goal of our Lord. This makes Golgotha, Mount Calvary, the highest of all mountains. It is the goal, the doorway, home. Lent is about climbing up and out of this valley to reach Calvary, to die with our Lord, as St. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, so that we may rise with him. What does he say? If we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall live also together with Christ. If we die with Christ, we will rise with him and we will ascend with him. No purgatory, no going down into the earth. If we have paused in our climb toward the holy and perfect death, or even fallen back down toward Jericho, Lent is a time to change that. St. Luke describes the determination of our blessed Lord to keep climbing come what may, saying in the gospel, when the days of his assumption were accomplishing, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. We need to do the same. We need to set our face toward Good Friday and Easter will be our reward. As the gospel also indicates, we're not climbing alone. Thank God. The blind man heard a multitude passing by. After his cure, the blind man followed his majesty with the others. This shows that we belong to a body, a church, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, and why we do penance together as a body. It's easier. We're to climb together. We have Fridays to do penance. We have vigils and seasons like Advent and Lent. We are to climb together. We are saved in a flock. We follow Christ, the head. Does this not make it easier? We should do some things as a family, as a household. Makes it easier. But perhaps you're saying, well, who is leading us now, Father? How few there are, it seems, who are in positions of leadership guiding us up. Seems like they're all saying, oh, you're fine where you are. Well, you can even go down a little bit. It's okay. We're hearing a lot of that. It's scary. We're hearing that we should just loosen up and mitigate. I think the theme over the last few decades has been very simple. You can summarize it in three words. Mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. That's the theme song over the last several decades. Lighten up, lighten up, loosen up. Mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. It's true. It's undeniable. Set your face, dearly beloved. Set your face like flint. To climb, lest we give up like Lot's wife, who looked back and became a pillar of salt. Again, notice the path chosen by His Majesty. It is up, not down. It is through suffering, not lightening up. His way of leaving the world behind is the passion. As hard as it may sound, this too is our path without fail. There's no escaping it. We too must set our face toward Jerusalem and follow Him on the way. And that is what Lent helps us to do. Learn to embrace some suffering in doses we can handle so that we can handle bigger ones later. Lent is coming. There's a worksheet in the back of the church. Please take one with you. It will help you. Now, true, this can be hard at times. I don't doubt that. I... <laughs> I have a hard time too. I'm squirming right there with you. Blind people do not use their muscles very often. They're not used to climbing mountains. Yet once this good man sees, this is what he has to do. He's got to go up. 
If he can do it, so can we. The starting point is the deep valley. We can imagine the smog and the clouds. It's not too hard nowadays. Coming from Jericho. Smog that causes doubts. Makes us wonder if the climb is really worth it. Now it's even coming from inside the church. We have then the authority of Pope Paul VI. Who said, the smoke of Satan has entered the sanctuary of God. We're in it. The smoke is here. We have to set our face like flint to get free of it. Then there's all the sound coming from Jericho. All the people, they seem to be having so much fun. You Catholics are so old-fashioned. The blind man, now able to see, has to walk boldly and painfully up and up and ignore all this, leaving this behind. There will be times when he will wonder why he is doing this. What's the purpose of all this? We can think today, perhaps something like this. Why does the church teach that anyway? That's what the media is trying to tell us. And frankly, some people inside the church too. We can change that now. Yikes. Why does the church do this or that? We ask. Why do we have to do it this way? Why all the confusion, even from the very top? We're in a fog. No matter, keep going and go up. How do you know where to go up? Do what they always did. What did the saints do? Do that. We're going to be all right. Now, this stage of the climb in the fog represents the beginning of a spiritual life. But if we progress, we will break free of this fog. Just as the blind man's muscles become stronger as he climbs, so also our spiritual muscles become stronger as we live more and more by faith, hope, and charity. If we keep going up, the air will become cleaner and more clear. Soon the sun will break out and we will see many things clearly. Thus, the first part of the journey is called the purgative way, where we purge our faults and purify our souls. At first, we do these things to just avoid pain. I'm afraid of hell. I got to do this because... If I don't, I'm going to go to hell. We're afraid. It's our motive. Or we want to gain consolations. We want people to see that we're doing good. We want our parents to be happy with us. We want God to give us that sugar. We do things for human reasons. Sort of like a kid does to avoid punishment or to get that piece of chocolate cake. In this stage, we have to work at destroying Jericho's hold on our heart. We have to overcome habitual sins, especially big ones, mortal sins. Sadly, many turn and go back down. Last Sunday's gospel, stony ground, thorny ground, remember? Keep climbing. Now, for those who keep going, then comes the illuminative life, the illuminative way where we see things more clearly and we practice virtue more readily. We do things because it's the right thing to do. And we know so by faith, not because of the rewards we get. Because we know this is right and I'm doing it, period. The nature of the world and the teachings of the church become more clear and understandable. And after this comes the unit of life, where we act purely out of charity love of God and love of neighbor that charity St. Paul spoke of so well in the lesson today those who make it this far perform many heroic acts and feats for the Lord they are the saints nothing bothers them but sin it is noticeable when our Lord did arrive on Calvary not many made it with him Where was everybody? Let us be among those who do make it, realizing now that in the end, everyone, as shocking as this may sound, everyone in the end is a stigmatist bearing the wounds of Christ in some way or other. Those who are crucified with Christ in this world, they die with him and they go straight to heaven. They've been crucified. They're stigmatists. There are only stigmatists in this life, though, in pain, and next life, in glory. On the other hand, there are those who do not finish the job of climbing to the cross, and they have to finish being crucified in purgatory for a time. And it's very painful. 
But those who turn away from their end of dying with Christ, refusing to climb, living in Jericho, wallowing in sin, will be crucified eternally in hell. Forever bound, unable to move. Lent is here, dearly beloved, to help us avoid this dismal end. Let us use it well at this important time in the history of the church and the world. Let us end by reviewing briefly a few motives that can be gathered from our reflection today. The higher we climb, the more we see. The cleaner the air, the less the confusion. Peace of soul. The higher we climb, the more we reduce our purgatory. We have to arrive at the summit anyway. Better to do it now than to do it later. The higher we climb, the less we sin and offend God. The higher we climb, the more the demons have difficulty tempting us. And finally, the higher we climb, the more we grow in charity, attaining to a higher place in heaven. There's a worksheet in the back. Lent is coming. Feel free to take one to help you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.